I often get asked about Japanese tabletop role-playing games. This isn't some kind of humble brag, I'm just kind of autistic, enjoy delving into them. There's something unique to them, something different from the usual slog I have to go through. Now, this could be a case of Place Japan, but I don't think so. It's an evolutionary divergence. In a far less Darwinist way, JTRPGs were the result of a series of events that modeled them into their current state. Their own sphere, own industry, own thing. While we went through our own path, they differed. They went down a different angle, a different area. An interesting case study more than anything. So join me as we learn why they are the way they are, and you get to share this video to any of your friends who ask why JTRPGs are the way they are. Welcome to the Japanese bubble era. Life's good is in full swing. Japan is the center of the world and everything is looking up. But we're on a mission. Now, what are the largest TTRPGs in Japan right now? As with the rest of this video, there are going to be three of them. Two may be obvious, but one is going to be a little bit odd. Well, let's start with the least obvious one. Released in 1986, Battletech, or more precisely Mech Warrior, enjoyed massive popularity among Japanese audiences. Now, this may seem a bit weird, isn't Battletech a war game? It is! Mech Warrior has a bit of an infamy of being little more than just a narrative justification for playing more Battletech, but they proved immensely popular in Japan. Battletech had already had its toes in Japan through a few different sources, notably its connection with Macross, or Robotech, hence the name. Early Battletech used Robotech designs, and the game itself played more like a board game, clearly laid out hexes and miniatures to enjoy. It was already a stable board game, and had fairly extensive in influence currently, as well as being something the Japanese already knew. Now combine this with the RPG being more of like a choose-your-own-adventure-based scenarios, and you get to play more Battletech! And there's story! The second may be a bit more obvious, but Call of Cthulhu by Chaosium was a massive influence in the Japanese sphere for three simple reasons. It was relatively cheap, with only really the main book being needed to play and a few add-ons. The game's adventure paths are still regarded as novel-worthy in many circles, and combined with the literary translation of the works, the intent was never a loss, as in a lot of other cases. But the final one is the most important. It's adaptable. You can set Call of Cthulhu adventures anywhere. You want to go to New Orleans? New York, London, Osaka, Tokyo, Yokohama? Suddenly a GM isn't just restricted to a fantasy world or deep space or something that they don't know. It's right outside. Something's closer, something more personal. The third game on this list also is the obvious, but it's Dungeons & Dragons. Ryu Mizuna was a game master for his group that would later become Group SNE and, seemingly of his own volition, wrote down their adventures together. Though, it was fate that he wrote D&D as his first game was Traveler. Imagine that. But I digress. This little thing became the record of the Lotus War, and it became a smash hit by creating a format called a replay. These replays are actually retellings of sessions from perspective of players and the GM, written more like a novel than anything. People loved it and wanted to play D&D, &D, but there were a few issues. D&D &D wasn't extremely well translated, hence the prevalence of dog bolds and other oddities of Japanese Western fantasy settings, as well as being quite expensive. This was the box RPG era, and there were quite a lot of special dice to be used, of course. If you're buying everything back then, it may have set you back $20 in United States dollars, or around 56 bucks today. But this is also a lie, with shipping rates and such, and it already being niche, exact numbers are difficult to find, but at $20 in the US in the 90s-ish may have been easily over $100 in Japan, maybe even more. This quirky little hobby was really expensive and really only at the hobby of people really dedicated to it. You couldn't just go to the store and buy the books, you had to sp save for those books, and maybe not even get everything out of it. So Mizuno, his publisher, and various other forces created Sword World. It was a combination of different games, a bit of Tunnels and Trolls, a bit of Wizardry, a bit of D&D, but what it was was proof that the Japanese market wanted something adapted to them. Using only a 2D6, the game was pretty fast, easy to pick up, and guess what? It was really cheap. It was almost the same price of a lot of mangas back in the day, hence the paper quality. So we've established a little bit of history, so let's zoom forward a bit to the modern day.
Welcome to now. The modern JTRPG sphere has all the bits mentioned before as fairly common factors. The Japanese audience diverged. They fell in love with Call of Cthulhu's deep scenarios and started writing their own. A fairly extensive amount of their own, to be frank. You can find a scenario for just about any Call of Cthulhu adventure of your choice. You can also find front-loaded design and beliefs from Battletech with quite a few indie games having board game elements in them for faster play. And, of course, replay. Lots of replays. Oh, Jesus, that's a lot of replays. Now, where do they differ from the Western Sphere and why? Well, there's a few points, but the most important one to note is structure. Scenarios are common enough to justify entire games, such as Emo Color being built with them as a base assumption of play. Almost any game you see, there will be details of some kind or pre-built adventures or suggestions of how to build your own. But these aren't necessarily adventure paths the way we think of them. Some of them can be just time, place, and situations. Others can be so detailed, it's effectively a choose-your-own adventure book. Next is front-loaded character design. Have you ever used used a pre-made character before, quite a few haven't, and some games over here don't even bother including them outside of an example. But in Japan, they are ever-present, even to things such as the Uma Mizume TRPG, which two of the three options of making a character are pre-generated characters, sort of pre-generated, and a custom one. Sword World 2.5 even has a developing party through its three books, allowing you to pick up and play while just writing your name into it. The final part is play structure. You may be playing a game with the hunting phase or the collection phase, Phase, it might sound like a board game. Similarly, some of its history, these phases are found in quite a few games. Most of the time, it's dedicated to the drama phase or the action phase, such as with the Muvlove Love Alternative TR to PG. But they may even have players take turns for certain actions, changing the game entirely when it shifts to the new phase or new event. Not to mention that most of these smaller games start panicking when you mention that there's going to be a second session. I've heard people say that JTRPGs are restrictive to play, and they are, but you also have to assume the situation. Space is limited, a commodity in Japan. You don't go to someone's house or apartment, you go to a karaoke bar, you go to a library room, you go to a place and rent it. Every hour is another few dollars and more time elsewhere. Time's the name of the game, you're always crunched for time. We may think that a four hour session is pretty average, that's bonkers. We don't have time for that, we need to go faster. And now that you see the three parts above, uh, we need a scenario because it takes time to put that together. We need front loaded characters to make sure we can quickly jump into the game or make characters on their own without any risks. And we need that structure to clearly indicate pace of the gameplay. This is evolutionary divergence at its finest. But where are these games? Out here, anyway. You may have noticed there aren't many JTRPGs here in English, or any other language to be honest. There's a few reasons, but some may be obvious. Translation is expensive, the market is competitive, and most indie devs out there can barely afford to have enough for a game market booth. But we do have some, but things start getting weird. Starline Publishing is Ewan Clooney's Wild Ride, and it's translate two of Ryu Kamiya's games, Made RPG and Golden Sky Stories. He also changed things in the Made RPG, and a lot of Golden Sky Stories material remains untranslated due to his own commitments, as well as making his own things for both of those. Their blue amusement brought over Double Cross and proceeded to dis a fucking peer. They're, they're just gone. I have no idea what happened to them. Kamigakari had a fairly extensive fan translation for years, with the license actually getting bought by Serpent Sea Games, which has had significant financial issues over the years, namely the head of the company taking the money and causing a lot of internal strife from management problems and various other problems, and it's a whole shit show. Silverline Publishing, though, has put out Summon Skate and Floria, both of which had issues in a variety of ways, but have done some Kickstarter shenanigans to get their money. Their other projects have stalled from the looks of things, so... Oh, and, um, uh, of course, Kotodama Heavy Industries, Ryutama, Shinobagami, Tenra Banjo Zero, all of which are great on their own rights, but have, um... Well, Kotodama Heavy Industries is dog shit. They are dog shit at their jobs, because while they do do solid translation work, they do make frequent promises, many of which are broken, which has almost every single one of their Kickstarters be a resounding failure. Christ, how do you guys fuck up this much and still try to get more out of it?
In this world of stopped time, I have to make sure that I acknowledge that Yen Press translations of Goblin Slayer and Konosuba TRPGs do exist. The thing there is that they are franchises, quite big ones as well, with corporate entities interested in their success. If we see some non-franchise games come out from Yen Press, we'll see if this still holds, but understand that all the ones I've mentioned, TL games that aren't backed by super giants as directly as Goblin Slayer or Konosuba. Time must resume. The truth of the matter is, is that translation is expensive and time-consuming, and any translator talented enough to do it consistently and well is probably not in this industry. It's also entering into a sphere that's been on fire more than it's been put out. It's just not worth bringing over a lot of JTRPGs outside that novelty factor. If you really look at them, a lot of them have that particular weeb factor or ghibliness to get others on board, but we'd never really be able to see something like emo lore or Kiznite in English, well, except for me. And that leaves fan translations, which have produced very good results. The Lost TRPG from Ancient Scars, Princess Wing translation, and even Sword World 2.5 have found themselves in English for free! And that also disincentivizes bringing any of those over. If there's no gain to this, why would I bother licensing it, sending it over, and then having someone charge nothing and get nothing out of it? And so that leaves us in a particular state where there are quite a few JRPGs out there, some of which we'll never see. Ever heard of Lavera Doll? What about World's End Journey? Probably not. Smaller games in smaller places, of course, but lovely in their own right. Different, unique, fascinating games. Some I would like nothing more than to see more of in these years, hopefully with less failed Kickstarters and promises. There's one last thing I want to cover. Before I close this out, I want to muse about culture a bit. Culture is the building block of what we do, how we do it, and why we do the things we do. And hopefully through this video, I showed you the power of what a culture can do and an evolutionary set of design principles. They took what they had and adapted, often in interesting and unexpected directions. But this isn't the first time this has happened. Enchanted Country is the first Russian tabletop role-playing game. It's a weird one, and it's a Polish AD&D translation, translated into Russian, interrupted by Slav Jank enthusiasts into quasi-board game RPG thing, written entirely in effectively broken Russian slang, and it's also a D18 system. Well, they had 2D6, but it's also a 0612 dive, but that's another story for another time. China has recently been making large pushes into the sphere. CanCon is fairly large, with a huge majority of TTRPG players being women who enjoy Call of Cthulhu, with particular brand of high mystic versions of the game being played with resurrection of characters in often more dramatic situations. Even a fairly popular wuxia show has seen an apparent tome be made for it. Now, this is of course not mentioning Brazil Supa 3.5 obsessions and botched translations, leading to the formation of Tormenta, Italian RPG design, French Scandinavian, all of it. Cultural influences us in our design. I don't think people want D&D settings with just a mention of Pelor replaced by whatever the local thing is. They want something for them, built for them, by them. And I respect that. I cry. Crave it. I desire to see this lovely hobby of mine develop out of that dragon game. There's more out there than it, and I encourage it so that I may dewang it more than anything. My name is Notepad Anon, and this was a diatribe on JTRPGs and culture a bit. Many thanks to the Plutocrats as always. God speak, good luck, and Zayonara! <laughs> साथ ना छोड़ेंगे